Next on the Broadway show, we love a parade. We're hanging out with the stars of the Broadway revival of Parade, including Tony Award winner Ben Platt. Plus, it's her Cinderella story. You'll meet the star of the new Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, Bad Cinderella. And all shucks, we've got an exclusive musical performance from the songwriting team behind the new Broadway musical, Shucked. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. It's The Broadway Show, and we're back with another great one. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Tony Award winner Ben Platt's back on Broadway, leading the revival of Parade. The Dear Evan Hansen star plays Leo Frank, a Jewish newlywed who's wrongfully accused and convicted of a heinous crime. The original production of Parade won two Tony Awards in 1999. Ahead of this month's opening night, we caught up with the stars. It means no, this isn't over. Hell, it's just begun. Hail the resurrection of the South's least favorite son. It's like one of the most beautiful scores in musical theater, in my yeah. opinion, and it's definitely been a hidden gem that the musical theater community has loved. So for any that are coming who aren't familiar, it's really gorgeous music, and I know that the subject matter is difficult, but there's a lot of beauty and like sumptuousness that really even out some of the more difficult elements of the show. Every voice that opens their mouth on stage is actually really, really stunning, um, and so I think people who love beauty and, and music would, would love the piece too. To have the first preview be such a raging success where the audience refused to leave the theater. They just stood there and applauded. And outside the theater were these neo-Nazis protesting. And imagine a case that happened 110 years ago, still in generating that kind of passion. We got Ben Platt, we got Michaela Diamond. They incidentally are the first two Jews who have played those parts. But suddenly loud as a mortar, there is hope. People are like, this is a Jewish musical, and I think that's misleading, and I think that um, this is really a story of the justice system failing a specific minority, and I think that there will be a lot of people who can connect to it who aren't Jews or who don't know a Jew. It remains my greatest dream and greatest joy to, to be on Broadway. It's all I ever wanted for when I was like six years old. Um, and that doesn't go away. And so I just feel really lucky that I get to come back at all, let alone in a show that's beautiful and with a co-star that's beautiful and like a company that's beautiful. Um, but every night it's just still, the, the, the novelty of getting to do this at all has not worn off on me. They call me a wretch, a witch, a well one. Every fairy tale for sure. She's no damsel in distress, she's bad Cinderella. It's an inclusive modern day retelling of the classic fairy tale with songs from the legendary Andrew Lloyd Webber. And the star of this brand new musical is living her own Cinderella story. She's this week's Fresh Face. Hi, my name is Lenady Hanal and I play Cinderella in Andrew Lloyd Webber's Bad Cinderella. I'm just honored and grateful to be in this position to play a princess, a Latina princess, and to be Andrew Lloyd Webber's first Latina leading lady to originate a role is a big deal, much bigger than me, and I hope inspires so many other little Cinderella's that hopefully see themselves represented on stage. I am I've been singing since I was little in church. My dad was the director of the choir. My mom and all my aunts sang in the choir. So music has been a part of my life since I was born. But theater, I got into in high school. I didn't know you can sing, act, and dance at the same time and tell a story. And it wasn't until I had the most incredible teacher of my life, Eric Nyquist, who really saw the potential in me and pulled it out of me and just like, showed me that this is something that I could do, that I could express myself in this art form. So I auditioned for the top three schools I heard of at the time that were like, you have to audition. And I said, okay, if I get in, I'll do it. And if not, I'm not good enough and I can't. And I didn't, I didn't get in. I got into their business schools. So I uh, got my degree in business administration and I continued singing in my community, doing community theater, joining choirs. It wasn't until I went to the open call of On Your Feet, the Gloria Stefan musical with a selfie I printed uh, at Walgreens from my iPhone 4 because I didn't have a professional headshot. And with high school theater experience, I made my Broadway debut. 
What made me say yes to that open call was very much like the audition for Cinderella. I didn't have to pretend to be anyone else. They were looking for Latin artists. I grew up on Gloria's music. I was like, let me just go and be me. That's why I wasn't afraid because I didn't have to put on this character. And the same with Cinderella. It's a story we've all known since we were born. And so it wasn't something I had to pretend to relate to because I could and I knew that story inside and out. And so I just brought myself to it. I am It sometimes hits me really hard where I cry out of gratitude because this is just such a big moment. And other times I feel a sense of confidence and pride in all the work that I've put in and you know all the tears that I shed and how you know we've all worked so hard in our own ways and I had to learn everything from scratch with, from my incredible colleagues at work and all the the fellow actors um, who put you know held me under their wing and taught me everything that I know today. Just grateful, just grateful, 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 pinching myself. People should come see Bad Cinderella on Broadway because I promise you, you're gonna leave laughing. You're gonna leave on a high of joy. You're gonna have a great time. And it's your unconventional fairy tale. So everything you think you know about the story, you don't. The New York theater community continuing to embrace inclusivity, showcasing a growing group of diverse talents, people of all colors, orientations, and those with disabilities. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. Thanks, Tamsin. Today, I'm excited to get to know Michael Patrick Thornton and Ryan J. Haddad. Ryan's up first. He's actually right over here at the Historic Public Theater premiering his new play, Dark Disabled Stories. We are at the Public Theater. This is like, I, I know you're a real, Yes. Theater fan. This yes. is an institution. Of course. Think about course. all the musicals that started here. I mean, Hair. I mean, A Chorus Line. I mean, Fun Home. And now we are doing and now, decidedly not a musical. Dark Disabled Stories. So can we go inside and chat a little bit about this? I hope those? so because it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of cold. We should go inside. People know you for being very funny. Hi, are you single? Hi, are you single? Hi, are you single? This time, you aren't leaning so so much on the humor. You've been telling your story uh, as a openly gay man with cerebral palsy, sort of navigating the city. Growing up in Ohio, Haddad fell in love with Broadway divas, show tunes, and a glamorized image of New York City. That sort of cotton candy version of what the city could be yeah. did not in any way prepare me for the actual reality of trying to get from point A to point B and back again and not spend a million dollars on cars because the subway is a treacherous mess. The city is, is intense. And so these stories in this play are intense as a, as a sort of mirror to that. I came with my Aunt Janice to see the revival of Ragtime in 2009. It was the first time that I sort of publicly fell in New York within two seconds. There were five complete strangers just lifting me off the ground. And that almost always happens. So this play is about strangers that you meet when you think you're alone in a city where you're never truly alone. Dark Disabled Stories started as a solo show, but Haddad is now joined on stage by two co-stars. Deaf artist Dickie Hartz appears as his alter ego, performing the show in American Sign Language, while Alejandra Espina, who has cerebral palsy and uses a wheelchair, offers audio descriptions for theatergoers who are blind or have low vision. Look, it's lonely up there by yourself, so you have yeah. some co-stars. Yeah. And I believe, isn't it also op open captioning? Mm -hmm. So, which means that it's captioned on the set, which I appreciate as someone who's yes. hard of hearing. So it is open captioned, audio described, and then we have Dickie playing Ryan alongside Ryan, who is also playing Ryan, and he's doing it in ASL. What do you want people to know about living with cerebral palsy? Primarily that when I get up in the morning, it's just not right. at the top of my mind. The top of my mind is, am I gonna be late? Or does the boy I have a crush on also have a crush on me? And then I step out into the world and am reminded, oh, okay, you've got to move a little slower. Mm -hmm. That is when it sort of becomes the narrative. With his acclaimed stage performances and a memorable turn on Ryan Murphy's The Politician, Haddad is living out his childhood dream. That little boy wanted, wanted to be on Broadway. And that big boy still wants to be on Broadway, but sort of has recalibrated the way in which I might 
arrived mm -hmm. there. As Haddad went back into rehearsals, I headed to the Hell's Kitchen home of Michael Patrick Thornton, who just opened opposite Jessica Chastain in a doll's house. Last season, he made his Broadway debut in the Daniel Craig-led Macbeth. Thank you for having me in your home. Thank you for coming to my home. Are you getting used to working on Broadway? I've had this dream since I was a kid. I remember like rehearsing Tony and Oscar speeches in my shower when I was like nine years old. I wish I could kind of go back in time, like tap that kid on the shoulder and be like, hey, everything you dream about is gonna happen. You're just not gonna believe what you're gonna have to go through to get it. When you were 24 is when you had two spinal strokes too because the first was just so much fun that my body was like, let's do that again. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's a very medically anomalous thing. It's like an episode of Dr. House, which turned, uh, you know, a 24-year-old uh, knucklehead into uh, incomplete quadriplegic on a ventilator within a matter of an hour and had to teach myself how to basically breathe and talk again. Even through the darkest days, Thornton knew he wanted to continue to follow his dreams of being a working actor. So what was it like actually getting out there and auditioning and... It's horrible. You're going back to the same casting director offices, but you can't enter through the front door because there's two steps. So now I have to go to the alley, going up a ramp that's completely rusted through, riding up in a freight elevator with spilled Coca-Cola so that my wheels are sticky and I smell like garbage when I, by the time I get into the room to try to get a job and be confident. It was hard. Thornton especially enjoys playing characters that traditionally don't use a wheelchair, like Dr. Rank in A Doll's House. My long-term strategy has been to do stories where the wheelchair is not a plot point. Right. You force people to simply accept you as a human being. What is it like sort of navigating New York City? I had this thing that I clip onto my chair that lifts my two wheels off the ground and turns the wheelchair into an electric trike, basically. And I make it to, to work in five minutes. Broadway operates in very small, old buildings. Really? For the most part. <laughs> I hadn't noticed. The entrances and exits are tricky if you're a wheelchair user. They've installed a stair chair, kind of like the uh, motorized chair, like in Gremlins 2 that the person signed, I love you know? that that's your reference. Of course it is. And I think it's actually the same one Allie Joker used for Oklahoma. It's tough, because as you said, the spaces are so small, but um, they have to have uncomfortable conversations to see how we can make this, you know, a, a little more easier on the next generation. This is a Broadway show, and we're back in just a few. My name is Nasia Thomas. I play Anna of Cleves in Six on Broadway, and you are watching The Broadway Show. <laughs> Welcome back to The Broadway Show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's get back to it. It's Broadway's brand new farm to table fable. It's the new musical, Shucked. We're checking in with Beth Stevens at the new 42 Studios. Thanks, Tamsin. Shucked pairs Grammy-winning songwriters Brandi Clark and Shane McAnally with Tony-winning writer Robert Horn for a countrified fable with a whole lot of corn. I checked in with them as they readied this new musical for Broadway. So this is a brand new musical. People probably don't know what Shucked is about. Can you give us just a, a real quick idea? <laughs> We should be better at this by now, as many people ask what it is, especially with the title. I mean, mm -hmm. we think that the title is a funny pun or uh, just fun to say, but oh my God, how many times do you have to repeat it and repeat it? And then they say, oh, like oysters? And, you're like, and I always do them. I'm like, you know, shucking corn. Well, it's a fable, a farm to fable. It's about a, fic a, you know, a fictional town called, well, a county, it's not even a town, Cobb County, and it is surrounded by a corn wall. And what happens is the corn starts- Literally a wall a of corn. A literal wall of corn. No one has left, no one has ever come to the town, but the corn starts to die. And so their way of life is in jeopardy because everything is fueled by the corn. And so they have to make the brave decision to leave. And there's only one person who is, is brave enough to leave, and that's our heroine, Maisie. And she goes to the big city looking for someone who will help fix the corn. She meets a corn doctor, who's a, really a podiatrist. It's just a comedy of errors from them. Maybe love is like a seed. A little sun is all it needs. A little rain, a little rain. And so it goes, and so it goes. 
grows and it grows and grows and grows and grows from dust. You're known for writing songs that really come from the heart. So tell me how it is to sort of marry your style with this Broadway corny fable. It is ridiculous and there is a corniness to the idea. But when you get into the heart of it, at the heart of it, are these characters that are colorful and relatable and human amongst this cartoon-like world. And that is what appeals to us. So yeah, it's a musical about corn, but it's about family, it's about community. And there are moments where you're laughing so hard and then moments where most people who have seen it are crying. You laugh till you cry and then you cry till you laugh. And hopefully, you know, everyone will feel that. And I think, I think they will. To speak to our music and our songs, we wrote songs that we really wanted to be able to stand alone outside of the musical. We were so intentional on trying to write hit sounding songs within this original musical. Songs that people didn't know, but they would feel like they did. My best friend, I'll be yours until the end. Blood is thick and whiskey's thin when we're together. My old friend, ins and outs and outs and ins. We've been family all our lives, but we'll be friends, friends forever. You two are very well known for being good friends, getting along. Tell me how you work together. It's special. I, there's nobody I work with like Shane. But I think what we really have going for us is that we have a respect for each other where we can say, pardon the pun, the corniest thing ever, and the other one doesn't shoot it down, riffs off of it and turns it into something great. We always preface with, this isn't it, <laughs> this isn't it. It's like, not this, but something like this. It's a dream collaboration. I, I, I do get so emotional thinking about what this career, this life would be without her. You know, I can barely look at her when I talk about her, but we're so lucky that we found each other and the timing was so perfect because not only did we really help each other at a time in our country music writing careers where we both really felt like it was never going to happen for us and we had been doing it for a long time. We met right at the right time that this came together and I feel like this will be our, our biggest legacy. Thanks for staying with us for this latest episode of The Broadway Show. Glad you're here. A lot of people may not realize this, but not all Broadway musicals begin in New York City. They're actually born all across the country, all across North America and the world. Hi, my name is Danya Tamor. I'm the director of The Outsiders, which is having its world premiere at the La Jolla Playhouse in La Jolla, California. This is my very first musical. I think the thing that intrigued me first was the music. I heard the music first. I had never read the book as a kid. And then as I discovered more about the project, I became intensely curious about a story about masculinity that was created through the eyes of a girl. Uh, Susie Hinton was 16 years old when she wrote The Outsiders and her compassionate gaze on the young men around her is pretty radical and something that I felt really invested in investigating. I think that The Outsiders is so enduring because it's always been a story that somebody can project their own experience onto. Like it's popular all over the world, not just all over this country. It transcends class, race, ideology, religion, and I think that everybody can see themselves in these characters and that's part of why it still feels so important. Its main message is basically don't judge people and if you do judge people the result could be death. Like it is that dire and so I think the message of the story and her ability to show compassion for people from all walks of life is always necessary and even more necessary now than it ever has been. I mean, the stage adaptation I hope will also be iconic. It's extremely physical. I think that all 25 of our actors are athletes. I think they are NBA quality or beyond. They're Olympians. They do this eight times a week. So I think the physicality of the show and the embodiment of the show is very, very special and iconic. And I think the music, um, you know, I think that in so many ways, this music is so right for what a musical theater, musical theater is. 
but it's different than your typical Broadway fair. It speaks to the soul. It's got all kinds of American influences on it, gospel, um, rock, jazz, so many different things going on inside of it that I think the music is also really particular and helps the show stand out. That's all for now. I'll see you next time. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.